Welcome everybody to this afternoon's Schoology webinar featuring the illustrious Bob Schutz. Uh, he's here joining us today. He's going to give some insights from a technology coordinator. Uh, he's outside of Chicago in Palatine, uh, Illinois, and he's going to give his insights on the things that you should uh, use to evaluate uh, an LMS before you choose one. Uh, as we get started, uh, I'm just going to put up a poll to allow everybody to sort of come in and uh, show up. We still have a few people filtering in. Uh, and just to give a baseline of where you guys are now uh, with your LMS selection. So I'm going to show the poll now, and that should show up on your screen. And I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and show you the results. Uh, so as you see, uh, a lot of you, sort of a mixed bag here, uh, a lot of you are not sure. Uh, so this is a great place to, to come. One of the things that, that Bob's going to talk about is sort of the very basics of, of what an LMS is and, and what it does and how it interacts with the rest of your, your schools or your district's technology. Um, a lot of you already have a, an enterprise that already. Um, some of you are using a free alternative, probably something like Google Classroom or Moodle or something like that. Uh, and so th these are all great options. We're going to go ahead and, and dive in and, and help you uh, evaluate what you have and also look for, for something new. And without further ado, Bob, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, everybody at Schoology. And thank to all our attendees. I really... Uh, appreciate and admire those that are willing to give up their time to learn more and to to sharpen their saws, if you will, and, and get engaged with uh, learning about stuff like this. Yeah, so Bob, if you could just tell the audience a little bit about yourself, who you are, uh, what you do in education currently, and, and what you've been doing for the last 25 years. Okay. Oh, wow, quarter century. Um, I'm a technology coordinator presently at uh, Palatine High School. This is where I've been for the last 25 years. Um, spent uh, the first decade and a half as a social studies teacher, football, wrestling, and, and track coach. And so I've done a little bit of everything here. I was a dean for a while and whatnot. Um, but for the last 12 years or so, last I guess it's actually 14 now, I've been a uh, technology coordinator. And uh, so... Um, I'm always learning. It, it's nice to be in a spot where I'm at because every day is a little bit different. I'm always always learning something new, um, and I'm still engaged in teaching. It's just my audience shifts from day to day depending on on what's uh, what's required. So, once again, it, it's a it's a proud thing for me to be here and chatting with all of you. And I'm hoping that uh, Scott and I will be able to address your questions and customize um, what we have to say according to to what your interests and where you plan to go with your LMS decision. Yeah, and that's great, and that's a good point. Uh, if you notice on the right side, on the go to webinar panel, uh, you will see a little box there that says questions. Uh, so we encourage everybody throughout the presentation to ask questions as we go through. Uh, we have Dylan Rogers who is helping us out uh, filter through some of those questions. He's going to answer a lot of them directly, uh, but we're also going to try and get Bob to answer a lot of them if we can, uh, because he's the expert here and we want to sort of showcase his talents. Uh, and just to round up the introductions, my name is Scott Smith. Uh, I'm the marketing manager for K-12 here at Schoology, so uh, my job is really to uh, host webinars like this, uh, find leaders in education, and sort of showcase what they know uh, and share their insights. So Bob is a great example of that, and we're, we're super pleased to have him here. Um, so just to get started, uh, Bob, can you take us through sort of the framework, uh, the different things that, that you're looking at here and in, in sort of an overview of, of what we're going to cover today? Certainly. Um, I'm not sure who to give credit to for this slide, but I love the slide because it does kind of encompass the thoughts that, that come to mind when I think about choosing an LMS and um, really empowering learners. And, and for the sake of this conversation here, and I, actually most of the conversations I have, uh, I kind of group teachers and students together as learners because I think we're all, you know, if we're doing what we're supposed to in a school setting, then we're all learning and, and striving to learn a little bit every day. But an LMS is a really uh, a tool that really empowers learners, and so in different ways. And I think that's what you see here on this slide, is that it will add efficiencies to some of the processes that we use in a school setting, such as automating grading processes or uh, finding ways to engage uh, students in conversation, uh, enabling blended learning opportunities, um, and, and stretching the bounds of our classroom uh, time and space. Um, I, I 
our experience here shows that the LMS has really ramped up engagement for our students and for the adults and that it gives them additional choices, it, it lends their voice to learning processes, uh, and that segues into communication. Um, the LMS provides a myriad of ways that uh, we can communicate with each other, uh, either group to group, individuals to groups, groups to individuals, uh, in, a, in a variety of different fashion, and in a timely fashion as well, so that uh, students and the adults can receive notifications in real time. Um, they can receive um, messages that are convenient for them, no matter where they are or how they're connected to the to the web. Um, part of this, the empowerment to me, is using the LMS as a personal learning environment. That there are tools that will allow me to reflect as a learner, to curate materials, to connect with other learners, and to sort of. I'm going to refer to to the LMS as a, as a learning or a digital hub. So creating that centered uh, learning piece. So, you know, if, if I'm pulling stuff from Twitter and I'm pulling stuff from my RSS feeds and I have some Google Docs that I'm working with, do I have that coherent center where I can now make sense of all this stuff and be able to put it back out there in a way that's meaningful and relevant to other learners? Um, part of my role and uh, and our teachers, uh, since we're one-to-one -one here at Palatine High School, is is guiding our learners, the adults and the young ones, into being uh, digital contributors and being responsible with their interactions. And so I think the LMS provides a really nice arena, if you will, for our learners to practice their digital skills, to practice digital interactions so that they're uh, being civil and they're they're being productive and they're offering things that are uh, to the betterment of, of other individuals or groups. And then um, I think as you're investigating your LMS options, uh, one of the critical pieces I think is you know that your organization is going to evolve, you're going to evolve, is the LMS going to evolve with you? Is it going to provide new avenues for you to express your learning to uh, to be engaged as a learner. So I, I love this slide. I think it's a it's the perfect introduction into some of the things that we can talk about as far as choosing an LMS. Great. Uh, I think that's a, a good segue uh, as we start to dive into these questions here. Um, and I think the very obvious first one is what exactly is an LMS? Yeah, that's uh, in previous conversations we had, I was kind of surprised how many people we're just embarking on this journey for the first time. We, we're four years into our one-to-one -one implementation. We also adopted our LMS at the same time. And um, But I know there's some people out there that are venturing into this for the first time. So a learning management system, if you go strictly by the book, uh, you're talking about ways to um, record what's going on, report student, uh, student growth, um, administer what's going on in the classroom, create a workflow process. Um, so th that's sort of the by the book definition of it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you asked our students here at Palatine what they see as uh, what the LMS does for them, is it's that their digital learning hub, which means that's the centerpiece for their communication, the centerpiece for their collaboration. Um, it's their go-to spot. So uh, they may have a lot of resources available, but when they sign into Schoology, they have access to most of that just through that that sign-in. So that's a, you know, we could go book definition, but in reality, think of it like your learning hub and your your digital centerpiece. Sure, and and we also see a lot of confusion of an LMS compared to an SIS, which is the Student Information System. Can you can you give the a, a breakdown of like what what's different about those? Yes, it's uh, it's a good point to make. Our student information system, we use another, we use Infinite Campus. Uh, it's a pretty popular product out there, and that houses our student data and their demographic information. Um, it's the way that we report out uh, grades during marking periods, uh, record attendance, and it, it's uh, so it's the sort of the data warehouse for our students and staff. Uh, how that's different from the LMS is the, the LMS finds its way as a classroom support piece but then extends out and we're, what I mean by that is there's more opportunities shown each day for blended learning. So even though 
it it has its origin in the classroom. It really branches out into the community. It's a way to pull in parent engagement. Uh, we have community members that are able to uh, see what, for instance, what our business incubator classes are doing. They're able to chime in and, and check to see what uh, sorts of projects the students are working on. So SIS and LMS is different. If you're fortunate enough to have an LMS that is able to integrate with uh, an already chosen or a, a preferred SIS or the one that you're currently using, that's a great thing because that means that input into one is also input into another and they cross talk to each other uh, and add efficiency to what you're doing. Right. Yeah, and at the end of the day, saving time is, is it's a, a huge goal here. Uh, yep. So moving on to the, the next question, uh, maybe the, the, mo the second most obvious one is, is why would you need an LMS? Uh, why is it so important? Right. Uh, this is the type of question that makes me think, I, I think my brain operates geographically. So when I think of LMS, I'm already, I'm thinking about those places where I'm engaged with other learners or where I'm pulling content from for learning. And so the reason, selfishly, why I need an LMS is to pull these things together. Uh, if you, I, I read, uh, there's a researcher out of Canada called Stephen Downs, and he talks about personal learning environments and that because stuff comes at us from so many different directions in a digital world that we look for a way to make it coherent and make it centered and make it useful to us. So for a person, for personal learning, for my, it's a way of organizing that thing those things into an organized center. Uh, organizationally, uh, I reflect back to four years ago when we decided we were going to go one-to-one -one with iPads, and we were excited about that and a shiny new device, and wow, this is going to be so much fun. And then when we actually sat down and thought about it on what some of our, okay, what does this look like in the classroom? What does work, what does the mere, what, not mere, but what is the practice of handing out a worksheet for instance, mm -hmm. having a student work on it, get it back. What does that workflow process look like now that we have iPads? And so when we were coming up empty with some of those answers, we said, okay, well then we, we absolutely have to investigate this LMS thing. This this is what's going to solve some of those those questions that we have. Right. And I, I think it goes back to that, that sort of hub analogy that you brought up in the beginning. Right. Okay, so so for the next question, um, what are the problems you're trying to solve? So I, I guess with any evaluation, you, you should probably know what the problems are first. So uh, can you give an example of, of what the problems you wanted to solve? Hopefully when you, when you go through an implementation, there are issues or there's problems or there's things that you want to get better at. And so um, some of the questions that came to mind when thinking about problems that we're trying to solve is uh, increasing student engagement. Uh, there's some there's some Gallup research that's out there right now that says that from K through 12 that the level of engagement drops off significantly as students go through their their school process, and <laughs> that that hurts me. <laughs> so um, so one of the problems I see a problem is how do we keep students engaged and interested in learning and what's going on at school? And so if the LMS provides avenues to solve that problem, then that that you know that's win-win. That's 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 a solution I, I vote for. Um, also, considering the learners in our building, once again, adults and young people, what are tools that they need to, you know, to learn in a modern world? What what do they need to connect with other learners? What do they need to curate good resources? What do they need to um, be creative and productive with their learning? And then um, for me and my role as a tech coordinator, how can I help? teachers provide relevant learning experiences. So rather than, and I'll, I'll speak to this later on, but more than being a LMS evangelist or jumping up and down saying, yes, you got to do this, I'm trying to help as a strategist and show where the tool can help them be more effective and to, um, you know, help their students achieve in ways they, they maybe didn't anticipate or couldn't imagine prior.
Right. And we have a, uh, a question from Christina in the audience, uh, and maybe another problem that people worry about when they implement new technology. Uh, she says, I'm familiar with Schoology, but I was wondering in the classroom and for students, do they need training on internet safety or some other type of training before they're able to post things live? Well, uh, thanks, Christina. I th that's a good, good question. What I like about, and I meant to touch upon this earlier, what I like about Schoology is that it's still a walled garden, it's still a practice field for, for students to practice civil discourse and to practice communication in a digital environment. Um, depending on the level and the responsibility uh, that the, stu the students you're working with, you, you can moderate comments that are part of a discussion um, and you're not just turning students loose to the World Wide Web. Um, they can they can take risks within Schoology. They can take risks in the LMS, and you can be there to coach them and guide them. And then through some guided practice, you know, loosen the reins a little bit and let them go. So, right. I guess long-winded answer: uh, I don't think it's necessary to have prior training. Um, I think, as we'll talk about in a little bit, when you're choosing an LMS, I think you want to choose something that has a has an intuitive feel to it, so users can start experiencing it right away. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, so for number four, does the LMS support personal and professional learning? Why should people care about this? Well, um, I think we're in the ed <laughs> we're in the field of learning, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think if we stop learning, then maybe maybe there's another occupation that's better suited for us. But um, now nah, that didn't sound right. But <laughs> the main thing is. Um, does it support, as I mentioned before, I, I like the LMS for the fact that it supports my personal learning. Um, I also appreciate the fact that that for us um, as professional learners, that time is of the essence and we all have, we, you know, many of us have families and we have other commitments. So a way to offer training and to offer uh, content in a blended format or an online format and let, let learners engage with the material, engage with the tools uh, aside from a face-to-face -face session uh, is, is really helpful. So um, the fact that the LMS has a, a robust collection of tools that allow us to, to advance learners and also differentiate. Uh, some of us are beginners and some of us are more advanced. So the fact that we can differentiate the experiences for our learners I think is a critical piece as well. Are there, are there specific features that people should be looking for that enable this type of learning? Um, I'll, I'll tell you the, the ones that I see used more most often are uh, we we use our updates in the LMS quite a bit, uh, almost like announcements. Um, when there's uh, we will flip portions of meetings uh, using discussions. Um, we have more teachers and students using portfolios to sort of assemble evidence of learning, and um, I, I use the blog quite a bit as an area to reflect upon things that I'm learning about. So it depends on, on the, the user as what tools they, they see most relevant to their processes. Um, but the fact that, you know, I, I started off using the LMS this way, and, but four years later I'm using it entirely differently than I thought. Um, so it, it means different things to different people and that sort of flexibility I think is, is valuable. Okay, great. And that leads us to the next point. Is the LMS easy to implement and use? Yes. Um, and this gets back to Christina's question from a little while ago, is, you know, what, what sort of prior training or knowledge? Um, in my way of thinking, if you've used Facebook, if you use some digital tools before, then you'll find that at least, hopefully the LMS mirrors some of the function and the layout and the sort of feel that you have when you're using other digital tools. Um, when I see this question, I think of the, the Rogers curve, which is, which is his interpretation of uh, adopting uh, new innovation. And that you'd have, uh, on the right side of the curve, you'd have 30% 30, 30 of the people that are, are, are leaders and that are out front and they're early adopters. Uh, and then you have some, you have 40%, <laughs> but if my math is right, you have about 40% in the middle who are trying to find their way. And you have 30% on the backside who uh, Rogers would call laggers, but these are people that um, 
maybe have apprehension or resistance. So that curve looks a lot different when the tool is easy to implement. So instead of just a bell-shaped curve, it now skews it to the right where there are more people saying, okay, this feels good, this looks right, I'm familiar with this type of setup. Um, and so your numbers of early adopters are going to grow and that's going to pull the other people along. So that's why I think that ease of implementation and ease of use is a critical, it's a critical piece to all this. Yeah, and I think that also goes back to what you were saying in the last slide, all those different features that you appreciated. All those had elements of sharing and when you have teachers and administrators, and even students who are sharing with each other, uh, that actually helps that process along as well. You're not in it alone. Yeah, I, uh, one thing I learned the other, that share to button that's so popular on so many of the apps we use, I get, it's, I heard somebody say that's the Shero, and I didn't, I never heard of it called that before, so I thought that was kind of funny. And I, I think the Shero is just, that's it, or that's, it, that's the magic right there. And as a, as a tech coordinator, can you, Talk about how usability may impact your job specifically. Absolutely. Um, uh, it, ma it makes things more exciting, frankly. Uh, as I mentioned before, we were, we were addressing one of the uh, attendees' questions. If the tool is intuitive enough and people are catching on to using the tool right away, I don't have to be, as I was saying before, I don't have to be an evangelist for the tool. I don't have to sell the tool. I don't have to spend an inordinate amount of time teaching the tool. Instead, we can have deeper conversations on, okay, what are the types of experiences that you want your students to have? What are the type of experiences that you do you need as a professional learner? Okay, where, where in this menu of tools, how can we craft that for greatest efficiency and effectiveness? So rather than be an evangelist, I get to be a strategist and we can talk about teaching and learning where I think the focus should be. All right. All right, so for number six, uh, does the LMS provide mobile access and function? One of my favorite aspects of, of our LMS is that it has a mobile app. <laughs> and its versatility is amazing. We are one-to-one -one with iPads. So our 2,700 students are on the Schoology app. That's where their, that's where their hub is. That's where their interaction lies. Um, uh, I got an Android phone. So that's, that's here. And as I was talking about, you know, with Scott earlier before the session. I'm normally four to one at my desk. I'm on a Dell laptop right now, and this is my iPad, so I can use Schoology on my iPad. I can use it on my Android. Uh, I normally also have a Chromebook on my desk. I have the box here. See, here's my Chromebook <laughs> box. A student borrowed it. Uh, <laughs> a student borrowed it to, to do some homework and isn't using Schoology on the Chromebook right now. So, um, What's, what's cool, I'll share a brief story that, you know, I was waiting to pick up my son the other day at his friend's house, and, um, you know, the car's running, and I got the radio going, and he's not quite ready to come out from his friend, so, you know, got to pass some time, and I realized that a colleague from across the district mentioned, you know, we have a digital citizenship course that built out in Schoology, and he said, you know, one of your assessments has, um, has a duplicate question in it. And so I happen to have my phone with me, and, and I'm, I'm not driving. I'm just I'm parked, just so everybody knows that. But um, I fired up the phone. I opened my Schoology app, and I got a notification that offline accessibility now available. And so I was getting a wireless network, so I connected momentarily, and I lost that wireless. But offline capability meant that I got on my phone. I went to the assessment that had the issue, and I saw what he was talking, what he was talking about, uh, made some notations, and the fact that I could do that mobily in my car while I was waiting for my son to come out from a friend's house in five minutes, that's, that was five minutes well spent. So I love that sort of access and capability. I love the ability of, I, I love seeing students be able to capture stuff that happens, either videotape it or or photograph it. I, I, it's pretty exciting for me. We had a field trip that took place today. Another example, kids are getting off the bus and they're coming in with their iPads and they got their pictures and stuff and the teachers set up media albums so they're sharing their pictures and they're talking about what they saw in the field trip and so, you know, 
that's that's the good stuff. That's sprinkles on the cupcake. <laughs> Bob, you're making me hungry. Uh, can yeah. you <laughs> can you 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 talked about from from your perspective, from a teacher's perspective, from students, uh, how might this also affect a parent? I, that, to me, this is one of the, the absolute best things about the LMS that we have, and that we uh, help parents create their accounts. They sign in to Schoology. They can now see what's going on in their child's academic world. So they can observe um, discussions that are going on. They can, we do, as a matter of fact, we do have some parents that are also engaging in what's going on in the class, sort of like an interview or or just adding um, commentary to a book talk, for instance. But the fact that the parents can engage in what's going on in their child's academic life, child comes home, hey, what's going on at school? All right, there's a dinner conversation that a lot of times doesn't get very far. But if the parent comes pre-armed with some knowledge of what's happening in biology class or what's going on in in literature, then all right, there's a chance to have a more meaningful conversation. They're also able to see for their own child uh, progress. Uh, in some cases, uh, where our teachers are using mastery learner learning, or they're they're sort of uh, monitoring progress based upon um, learning objectives or standards, parent can see progress towards mastery, and uh, I think that creates richer conversations between between teachers and parents as far as helping children proceed and help them become, um, you know, more independent and, and self-determined as, as learners. Yeah. And Bob, I'm going to take this minute. Uh, we also have another poll uh, just to get a, some feedback from everybody else in the audience on what devices are being used in your school or district. Uh, and so this is a, a check all that apply. Um, so if you guys, uh, if you could uh, check which devices are used in your school, whether it's iPads, uh, tablets, uh, Chromebooks, uh, you know, full-fledged laptops, you know, you have desktops and computer labs, or if you have a BYOD, which is what, uh, bring your own device when students are able to uh, bring their own devices into school, whether that's, you know, their own laptop, tablet, or, or smartphone. Uh, so I'm just going to give uh, a shorter time to allow the answers to come in uh, this time so we don't wait, take up too much time, uh, but I'll just leave it up for another 15 seconds, uh, and then I'll show everybody the results. And this is a, a pretty interesting mix. As you see, uh, Bob, kind of like you on your desk, uh, a lot of schools likely have more than one device. So I think that, mm -hmm. that, that flexibility between devices is is pretty important. Uh, so that's that's a really interesting insight. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for, uh, for answering there. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and hide the results and, and show Bob's pretty face again. Uh, and we will <laughs> move on <laughs> to question number seven. Uh, so, does the LMS provide efficiency to teaching, learning, and sharing? Yeah, I think this is a this is a key question um, from the technology coordinator perspective. That once again is are we able to not spend a whole lot of time coaching to the tool, and we can spend time, um, you know, raising student achievement and and engagement and adding relevancy to to our learning processes. And um, interesting piece, a, a bit of a side note, uh, I, I read Will Richardson quite a bit uh, in Medium, and uh, this morning he's, he's quoting um, George Siemens as far as asking the question, is technology, um, while it's fast-paced and it's always changing and whatever, the, is it really allowing us the opportunity to engage more readily as a human being? Is it, is it going to free us up to be more creative with music and art and whatnot? So when I see this question, I think back to that, <laughs> to that blog post I read this morning that, that yeah, the, the technology is there, but does it get to a point where it's kind of transparent and it's, allow, it's freeing us up to do other things, to, to add perspective to our lives and to engage with, with other people and really grow as human beings? So just a bit of a side note. Um, but as far as um, increased efficiency, good LMS means you don't have to throw out the stuff that's working for you, that hopefully you're able to integrate it into the new experience. Case in point, I, I'm a big Google Apps user, and so I have a lot of stuff that's accumulated in my Google Drive, some 
that's not so worthwhile, but a lot of it that I'm I'm really proud of and really works for me, and the fact that I can draw from that in my LMS resources um, is is important to me, and it adds efficiency to a practice because that's a way that I can distribute information or uh, documents or files to other users um, pretty readily through the LMS. Um, and we touched upon the ease of, of learning a new system already, and um, are there are there processes integrated into the LMS experiences that will save time? Okay, uh, knowing teachers like I do and and colleagues like I do, you know, if they want to if they're going to learn something new, they want to know what's in it for me, what's what's going to be the benefit to me, and and are, if there's automated processes, if there's data that I can pull back in real time that allows me to provide personalized feedback to students. All right, I see the value of that. I'm willing to spend some time with this because I see there's going to be some added efficiency and effectiveness uh, coming for me. Great. And Bob, we have a question. Uh, we'll just backtrack slightly uh, about devices uh, from Vicki that says, what devices can limit the students in a BYOD environment. Uh, we seem to have no restriction or way to make sure that the students actually get to the assignment we give. Okay. And, uh, um, there we go. I think we had a momentary pause there. I don't know whose end it was, but yeah, you're good now. Um, but uh, Vicky, that's a great question. So thanks for submitting that. Um, from a technology point of view. The, our LMS is cross-platform, so that is not a concern. It'll work on anything. Uh, what I think you're asking is um, what sort of controls are are put in place for the educator uh, as far as different devices coming into the same classroom. Um, chime in if I'm misreading that question. But uh, I touched upon this earlier. There's there's a, a nice collection of tools. The one that comes to mind most immediately is to have uh, online discussions with your class, and there's a a checkbox for the teacher to be able to moderate those discussions so that um, before something is published for a class review, if you will, the teacher can decide, well, that's not really appropriate or and can stop stop that post from from being published. Um, so there's there's other types of controls in place as far as how much freedom the users have uh, versus how much restriction. Um, and so, uh, that's one of the strong suits of the LMS is that it's not wide open and transparent. It's transparent within there, and you can invite transparency when you want it. But if you can keep, you can have that concentric control happen within groups within your class. For instance, if you set up a course, you can have set up grading groups where groups of students have different amounts, different assignments, if you will, or different some different amount of access. And you can build outward from there if you want classes or your your entire school, for that matter, to have different levels of accessibility and um, responsibility. Great. And and then just a, a follow up to to this one. Um, it's also very new to to teachers. So uh, when you talk about efficiency uh, in teaching and learning and sharing. Um, can you talk about how the importance of getting these early wins for for teachers who you know have historically not had their own website or not you know posted things online? Yeah, good point. <clears throat> Sorry, um, I have my own blog that I started years ago. I, I think maybe five years ago, and um, I have a, a profile, an about me page, and I have um, profiles like many of you do on YouTube and Pinterest and Twitter and I was uh, struggling to find a coherent place, a place where, okay, this is the landing spot. This is where people are going to find me and find the stuff that I'm sharing. Well, five years later, I'm still tweaking that process. I'm still trying to come up with a, a look that feels right. Um, <laughs> so I'm here to tell you, save yourself some time. The LMS can get you started. The, the tools that I built out by hand already exist in our LMS. Had I had this four years ago, I would have just started here. Okay, I have a profile page. I have a blog. I have a portfolio. I have a way to reach out to Facebook. I have a way to reach out to Twitter. It's all here. What am I doing building this for myself when all of these tools already exist? So for the, the, the people just embarking on a digital adventure, 
the LMS is the perfect place to get started because you can run fast and fall on your face and get up and say, okay, I can tweak this and this and this, and it's a great experience, and you've got a community of other learners here to help you along the way. So for number eight, uh, does the LMS support communication and collaboration? Yeah, and I think this is these right here, once again, if you talk to our students, this is the key piece for them is to be able to work with other students, to be able to, uh, for example, I was just talking to a teacher who runs his office hours using Big Blue Button on, on Schoology. So, you know, knowing that he can't get to every student during every free period he has, he said, okay, uh, Monday through Thursday from 6.30 to 7.30, I am online at this time, and we will review what we did in class. We will prep for um, upcoming assessments. And so pro providing, you know, different avenues for people to stay engaged with what's going on in uh, school in the classroom I think is awesome. Um, when I see this slide, I, you know, this is a story I shared with, with Scott the other day. Um, I was working a track meet and the weather's awful, it's sleeting, it's raining, and I happen to be judging at the high jump area, and it's a girls track meet, and one of the girl competitors from um, one of our neighboring schools that's also in the district, um, using Schoology and using iPads. She's working on her approaches and she's struggling, she's slipping, she's getting frustrated. And uh, so she took some time, you know, took a breath, went and met with her coach. Her coach had an iPad. And he went to the Schoology group for the girls tra track team. And within that group was a media album. And so the media album contained videos of practice jumps and earlier competitions where this particular competitor had success. <laughs> so she took just a couple minutes to go and watch video and have that sort of collaborative coaching moment where she could see herself doing things the right way, made some adjustments, and then went on to jump and have her best, you know, her personal record was experienced during that meet. So I'm not sure that that kind of success would have been possible without the interaction of the device, the media album, and the LMS, and the competitor being able to, you know, reflect and process mm. on what she needed to do to be successful. That's a, a great story. Can you, can you, do you have an example of, of how this may have helped you uh, as a technology coordinator, as an educator? Um, I think the, the student collaboration is super great and super obvious, but maybe do you, do you have a, another thing you could point to? Yeah, I, I uh, just completed a second iteration, iteration of an online digital citizenship course that we delivered through our LMS. And uh, the first iteration ran into some snags, had some issues, frankly, um, mostly because of the, <laughs> the person that put it together. But one of the, one of the struggles I had was that um, this, we've, we took content and ideas from Common Sense Media and then we built it out in Schoology. It's for our ninth graders to go through as a completely sort of self-paced, gamified, gamified learning experience, if you will. And so we were progressing through it, and, and Keith Sorensen and I, were uh, a colleague, were working through it, and we were really struggling to, you know, okay, we should have more assessment opportunities here and some, some things that really keep the kids engaged, but at the same time allow them to progress through their, their completion rules. And so I reached out to the School AG Ambassadors. It's a group of um, – it's a, it's a learning community, if you will, that, of people that um, – want to learn more about the LMS and learn more from each other. And so Kelly Aidy, who is in Cherry Creek Schools in Colorado, mm -hmm. and she is what I would consider an education rock star and somebody I really respect her opinion. So I threw this out to the group. I said, hey, has anybody done this? What sort of activities and assessment ideas do you have? And within the hour, she got back and said, hey, go to this group on Schoology because I have these assessments already done. So I was able to grab them from group resources, put them right into our course, tweak them for, for the things that we got in our district. But it saved, it, it saved hours, if not days of work, to have that finally set up in a way that made sense. Yeah. And so um, that's an example of, of this collaboration. You know, I've only met her once face-to-face, -face, but we are consistently in contact with each other, sharing resources and learning from each other and, and frankly, saving each other loads of time.
Hmm. That's great. That's uh, that's really awesome to hear. Uh, so number nine, uh, does the LMS integrate with other services and tools? Yep. Good point here. You got um, those of you that are attendees. You you have some. You have a tool belt. You have some things in your tool belt that you like that work for you. Um, so. Um, you know, in addition to thinking of Schoology as a hub or the LMS as a hub, it's also a tool belt. It's it's another. It's okay. I've got Google Apps. I've got Office 365. I've got Turnitin. I've got all these things in my bat utility belt, and I can put them all together and make it into. You know, I can have digital workflow. I can provide feedback to students in meaningful ways using a plethora of tools at my disposal, and the fact that they can integrate into a single uh, single entity or a single tool or into this digital hub that we've been talking about it is awesome, awesomely powerful, and it really lets teachers and learners in general speak to their strengths. So my strength is not flipped classroom, but I know of a number of my colleagues that, that swear by it, that are very creative in their use of video, and the fact that they could create these videos, deliver them as part of their digital workflow, and get you know evidence of uh, student competency back, um, I was just talking with the teacher a little while ago that that he is able to provide voice feedback to his English students composing papers and as he, he said it used to take him hours and days to go through a stack of papers from a class but now when they're submitted digitally he's able to buy, add voice commentary and it's no longer red ink all over the paper it's his voice is there his meaning is there he can add sarcasm or humor into or you know, seriousness into, hey, uh, I think you can go stronger here on your concluding paragraph. And it only takes a few seconds per paper for that student to get that message and understand, okay, I know where my, you know, the teacher's coming from. I can fix this and improve it. Yeah, and I think, again, we're, we're sort of linking this to other things you've already talked about. Um, but when you're, when you're talking about other devices and, and how it can work anywhere, uh, I think, you know, being able to work on any device is, is super important. Um, you know, Bob, you, you have one-to-one -one iPads. Um, yep. I know we, we often get a lot of questions uh, about how you chose that and, and how that's worked out for you. Um, can, can you give a little comment there? Um, we're, we're in our fourth year of implement, implementation of one-to-one. -one. We did investigate a number of different devices. Uh, we looked closely at Chromebooks. We looked closely at iPads. Um, at the time, we felt that the ability for pen input, the uh, ability for students to have a mobile device that really could enable them to be uh, to be producers as well as consumers of digital content, we felt that was pretty important. Um, I will say, at the four-year mark, we are evaluating our device choice. I'm not saying it was wrong, but we will just want to make sure that you know. Did we, did we turn over all the stones? Are we looking at every possibility? Uh, and, and we have had conversation. Well, what if BYOD? What does that mean to our, our system? And, and so thankfully, while we, we're evaluating different sorts of pieces, the one piece that's been a constant for us has been the LMS. And so I sleep well at night knowing that no matter what happens regarding devices or direction that we go in, um, that the LMS is still, you know, that's still a foundation of, of what we're doing. Right. Yeah, and I, uh, I apologize. I, I jumped ahead of this slide a little bit when I asked that question in my notes. Um, that's okay. And and so uh, we, we uh, promised you guys 10 uh, ways to evaluate an LMS, but Bob and I went a little bit crazy here. Uh, so we actually have two bonus questions that we're going to go into now. Uh, so, so Bob, uh, can you talk about this? Is the LMS reliable and dependable? Well, our, our user, our attendees, they don't have to pay extra for these two additional questions, right? <laughs> no, I think, I think it's included. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Um, reliability and dependability, I'm sitting at my desk in my technology coordinator's office. I, actually, it's we're redoing the media center, so I'm kind of in a closet right now. But um, for me, the fact that the LMS has a greater than a 99% uptime means that I sleep well at night, not worried about malfunctions and not worried about the chaos that can occur when a system goes down. Because um, that, you know, <laughs> you, you in the classroom, you as administrators, you know how it goes when, when things don't work the way they're supposed to. We like when things work, right? 
uh, I've brought up an example before uh, in a previous webinar. I like the Keurig on the counter at home because I know when I put the cup under there and I hit the button, I'm going to get the same thing every single time, you know. And then if it doesn't work, I throw it away. But that's kind of I, I see our LMS as the same thing. I know it's going to work, and that's a comfort to our users. Um, I also know that if there's things that can be adjusted or tweaked, or if there is an issue that that we could use some help with, that I know that's an email or phone call away. And so I don't have to spend a lot of time chasing down support. I know I can find somebody to listen to me and, and give me assistance. And so the very few times that I've had to do that, I've had resolutions to my questions within 24 hours, 9 out of 10 times. And the other time it was something like, you know what, this is an interesting question that you raised and our programmers are working on it. So, and that, and that in itself is cool because then you'll see advances where, like, uh, rubrics can be copied and saved into resources, for instance. That's a change that came about because of educator feedback. So the fact that somebody is listening on the other end to suggestions that, that come from schools and classrooms, I, I think that's uh, critically important. And, and I also respect when the Schoology in particular has a plan and they're saying, here's what we'd like to do, here's the goals that we have in mind. We're listening to teachers, we're listening to students, we're listening to learners in all different types of settings so that we can um, provide an experience that's that's really supportive and efficient for our users. So I, I like knowing uh, where the product is going, what they see coming down the line and knowing that, hey, it's pretty good now, but there's also some cool things coming at us that's really going to help us step up our game. Yeah, and I think that's that's actually an important uh, point. No matter what technology you're evaluating as a, a school, a teacher, or an entire district, uh, you know, understanding that there's options for support for you, uh, they have a good track re record with their technology, um, and then also like, you know, this may seem simple, but but actually employing, you know, former teachers. Uh, we have a ton of uh, contract trainers who, who are still in the classroom today. And, you know, we have a, an ambassador program, which Bob is a part of, who gives us a ton of great feedback. Um, so I think, I think uh, there are other companies out there who do this really well. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the things you should look for when you're evaluating technology, because it, it's just kind of a, it's a safety net uh, and it provides some, some security. And so to understanding that, that, it's not going to just be there for a year, right? This is a, a long-term, uh, long-term plan. Yeah, and and you bring up a good point. When we were, when we chose our LMS, we we looked at dozens of products, and and all of them had aspects to them that that were really, that were really cool and things that we we liked. Um, at the time, um, we just felt like where we were with our one-to-one -one adoption and where where we were with our professional learning that this. Uh, Schoology best met our needs. It checked most of our boxes, and it's just worked out great that as we have evolved and grown and, and looking into our grading uh, practices and looking into shifts in our in our pedagogy, that, that Schoology has been able to, you know, evolve with us and support us as we change. Right. Now, for the last bonus question, uh, what are the features and characteristics uh, most valued uh, this 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 bonus question I think is one of the most important, if not the most important, because it reminds us that you know talk to your stakeholders, talk to your the the people that are going to be using the product the most, and find out are they using something already, and if they are, what do they really like about it, uh, what do they you know what do they feel could be improved upon, uh, and get gather feedback from as many people as you can. Um, if you're not using a product, then then find out you know. Uh, to pull David Jakes into this conversation, what are the learning experiences, what are the experiences that you want for your stakeholders, and will the tools that we're looking at support those types of experiences? Um, and, you know, I think having those kind of conversations or surveys or whatever, I, I, you know, around here we typically survey people to death, but, but I think sitting down and talking about what do people value and what are they looking for, um, I think will, will help grease the skids to some of these other questions and, and have some, uh, you know, take a deep dive into, you know, making an important decision. Yeah, that's great. And can you point to one feature that you specifically uh, really love or take advantage of? Uh, yes. Um, 
as I mentioned before, I, I have a blog that I've worked on for years, and, and, and I said that you know early on, my Schoology usage was kind of compartmentalized in this area, and it's expanded. And I, in particular, I'm finding a lot of value about in using the Schoology blog, um, and and much like other social media entities, uh, I'm connected with other educators. So the reason why I like the blog is it, it helps me. Um, when I'm learning something or reading something, it helps me reflect upon what I learn, and I throw it out there to an audience that I respect, and that will give me feedback and hopefully comment uh, on what I wrote. The, the the other aspect to the blog, and this is true of anything in Schoology. I mean, as far as assessments and assignments and discussions, the fact that I can embed other content into the blog, such as a short video or a podcast, that type of flexibility means it's not just words. I can bring other media and experience into it is helpful because I, I'm I'm interested in podcasting. I'm just kind of taking baby steps towards it. So but I see the blog is helping me get there. So that that's a tool that I, I enjoy and um, Dylan in particular is, is a role model for me and, and what he's doing with the Schoology blog and how he's adding value to to my learning and to the organization's learning. So I just taking his lead and trying to share what I'm learning and I'm trying to do it creatively and so the blog lets me do that. Well, I'm sure Dylan will appreciate that. He's uh, he's listening in right now and uh, answering questions. Uh, I want to also open this up uh, just in case you guys have, uh, the audience have any more questions. Uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up now and and answer the the final questions that are coming in. Uh, but Bob, I I do want to thank you so much for for taking the time uh, to to come with us today and and share this journey. Um, I hope this was all. Uh, really interesting to you. Uh, and just to, to sort of wrap it up with a few few last questions, uh, Bob, what was your biggest hurdle in getting your one-to-one -one program going? Ooh, that's a that's a good question. Um, do we uh, there's there's so many little logistical things to consider as you're you're rolling out as a as a technologist. I'm thinking, okay, what does distribution look like? What does collection look like? Uh, what does sustained cost of ownership look like? What uh, what sort of management pieces do we have in place? But then, if I step away from that and I just look at um, what value the device adds to learning, that brings me back to a more appropriate thing. Whereas, and I and I once again, I'm going to go back to Will Richardson. Uh, and I try and stay focused in this area. Are the decisions we're making, is it because we're making them to perpetuate an efficiency tied to teaching, or are we making decisions that are going to amplify learning and take our learners to places that, whew, exciting stuff. So I guess I guess the biggest hurdle is uh, just getting the stakeholders together, getting input, and no matter how we tried, we still had differing opinions on the type of device. But then when we moved away from the device decision and focused on learning experiences and how we're going to engage learners, that made the decision process easier. Yeah, and I think that's that's the probably good advice for for every technology choice. Um, one question coming in uh, from Guy Lane is, uh, what was uh, – I'm sorry, does your grade book, the SIS, allow you to update the grades in Schoology? I think you can uh, maybe address this and clarify some things. Yes. Um, right now, our SIS and Schoology aren't integrated. That capability is has recently been become available. We haven't taken that step to integrate yet. But when we do, one of the things that I'm anticipating is that um, we really like how mastery learning is laid out in Schoology. So that will allow teachers who want to use the Schoology gradebook to then grade reference uh, learning objectives as far as their grading practice. And then when they assign grades or they have a progress report, that will feed into our SIS, which then reports out to our portal so parents can get grades. Um, where, I, where I think the, the boom is going to happen is when parents sign in the Schoology and they can see based upon learning objective how their son or daughter is progressing in their learning. Then they're able to get more you know, richer information, if you will, than just seeing a letter A stamped on a report card. All right. And uh, we're going to take time for one final question. Uh, Bob, what was your strategy for getting every um, everyone on board with your LMS? Uh, you said it was intuitive, but what was your rollout plan? 
I love this question. Where, I don't know where that came from, but I love the question. The, um, for us, just as with, with a one-to-one -one device, we had a pilot group of teachers. We had our early adopters that were eager to roll, and uh, they got to try different LMS products. And it was really through a grassroots sort of movement that we, we um, uh, implemented Schoology on a wide scale. But what really helped in that rollout process is our continuing education, our institute days, and things like that were all, the experiences were embedded in Schoology. So if I was taking a class, even if it was on flipped learning, okay, we're going to learn about flipped learning, but Schoology is going to be the host digital piece so that we can share content and ideas and whatnot. So I think that's a critical piece in the rollout is that embed your experiences in the tool so that your users are, they're, they're there. They're already, you have a captive audience that can discuss uh, how to implement it. Great. Well, we're going to we're going to wrap up uh, just a few minutes early. Uh, but, Bob, we, we thank you so much for taking the time. Everybody who attended, thank you so much for coming as well. Uh, we hope this was useful. Uh, we'll be sure to follow up with you. If you have any questions, uh, you can always reach me at scott at schoology.com. Uh, if Bob is the better person to answer, I'll, I'll be happy to, to get you guys in touch. And uh, Bob's always here to help out. So we, we very much appreciate that. Uh, but thank you. It's a great again. team. <laughs> thank you again, uh, everybody. Uh, and we will see you again next month. Thank you, everybody.